Hello and welcome to the show. I have a special guest here. She happens to be in Seattle at the moment, but I met her during the New York City stop of the Don't Wait Project Tour just recently. Uh, she is the author of the new book, Nobody Gets Out Alive. Can't wait to talk to her. Thanks for being here, Lee Newman. Hi, thanks for having me. I love Seattle, honestly. <laughs> yes, I, well, you brought the sunshine. I did, I packed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we met, as I said, a couple about, it's almost been a couple of months ago now uh, when yeah. you were doing Zibby Owens podcast, nobody, moms don't have time to read books. And, um, and we met because you did one of her first in-person podcast interviews since COVID. So I got to meet you in person, which was really nice. Yeah, that was lovely. And I received from you one, an advanced copy of your book. So I've been uh, really devouring it. And let me tell you this. You had me from the second page. Can I read to you what I, what sure. got there? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love. It says Fred Meyer had some plug-in tropical air fresheners on sale. I bought a few. I shoved them into the outlets. Within minutes, the entire downstairs smelled like a burning car wreck in Hawaii. And I <laughs> laughed out loud and I was so happy to do that because, um, I mean, I just, right away, I, lo I loved your style. So let's talk about the book a bit, but before we do that, let's talk just about who you are and your story and what, um, let's talk about your life in Alaska a little bit and how, where these stories come from. Yeah. Um, so I moved to Alaska, I think when I was three months old, my dad was a doctor and he began working for the native health service and flying into rural bush communities, giving healthcare. And, um, when I was about, I don't know, anywhere between eight and 10, I don't actually have the firm dates on this. My parents got divorced and I would live with my dad for half the year in different chunks in Alaska and half the year for different chunks in Baltimore, Maryland, because my mom wanted to go back to the East coast. You know, we were, my dad was a pilot, you know, it was kind of a frontier state. And I don't think she, she responded to it the way dad and I did that. We loved it. You know, we were like dirty and fishing and hunting and hiking. And so you loved it even as a child. It wasn't like, oh my oh, God, I totally. go to dad's. Totally, totally, totally. I mean, I guess I complain like kids do because a lot of my child was spent in the deep wilderness, which at the time, you know, you know, there were not only just like no cell phones or sat phones. I mean, there was like nobody, you know what I mean? It'd be like me and my dad fishing for like days on end, you know, with no toys, you know, I would like play in the mud and, you know, gut the fish and play with the eggs and like make little collect snails. I mean, that was like a Is lot that of my the stuff childhood. you remember loving. I know at the time I was like, I'm bored, but right. I would, but then I would transition, you know, like by hour seven, right. You transition into like, and that's probably why I'm a writer and an artist, right. I spent hours and hours and hours amusing myself with sticks and right. mud and minnows, you know what I mean? And right. little, little like weird berries and making necklaces, you know? And I also at the time went to a school where you did not have to learn how to read or write. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I mean, Which literally really doesn't lend corners, itself to being, you know, a, to, yeah, but they were like, being a writer, does like, it? Well, yeah. If you feel like going to do some math, do math in the math corner. It was like the seventies. I never went to the math corner. I went to the bunny rabbit corner and played with the rabbits. Um, so, so how was it a contrast to your life in Baltimore? What did you oh, get yeah, in I Baltimore? Mean, that was, that I wrote was the a memoir about this reading. because it was mm -hmm. so weird for me, actually. It's called still points North. And that was the first book I ever wrote. And um, it was extremely weird. Like I had never seen brick houses. I had never seen a lion in a zoo. You know, all these things that I had never seen historic old colonial things. You know, um, the culture there was also, um, I know Baltimore is a complicated city, but my mom was involved in the, you know, more high-end private girls school, you know, aristocratic blue blood type of society. So it couldn't and, have been more different. Oh my God everything. Why were the men wearing pink pants with sailboats? I don't know. <laughs> you know like, and, um, and you know, it, uh, my teachers were wonderful and I, I do love Baltimore, but it wasn't not only not my speed. It was also like, there were values there, like country clubs and stuff. And we just didn't fit in. And I had a single mother, like she worked at Head Start. We were not going to the country club, you know? And so, um, it was really, it was a tricky adjustment, but I, I, I ultimately feel great about it. It's probably also why I'm able to like literally survive in so many different environments and why I'm able to write from so many different characters. Like in that book, there's eight different characters or maybe no, probably there's 15, I think, because right. when they did the audio, they told me, cause some of the stories are told from multiple characters points of view. And I do feel like when you live between cultures, you notice many, many things, no matter where you go, you know, it's often like bilingual children, you know, can really pick up things about each language that we wouldn't notice if you just speak one. 
Um, when, when you but, think, when I, when, when you mentioned that the language, what you just said about the book, um, t writing these shorts, the shorter stories and, and putting them in one book form, yeah. um, it's fiction is, uh, I've, I've written nonfiction fiction is right. harder for me. And what I feel like you accomplished here is my wanting to know more. And yet you covered everything I would want to know. Does that make sense? Any yeah. one of these could have been a, a, a novel in themselves. Any of these short stories. Well, I'm so been... glad you said that honestly, because that's what I wanted to do. And so it's like, when I, 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 you know, taking short stories necessarily was like not the traditional route, like the traditional route is you write a novel, right? Why am I writing stories? Well, A, because I love them. And B, I had not written one. I had written a bunch of stories that I did not think I had achieved what I wanted to achieve. And so when I sat down to say, hey, I'm going to do this in a serious way for like five years, my kind of, I set goals. I mean, I think a lot of like being an artist is deciding what you're going to do. And until you decide, literally, you're just floundering, you feel horrible, you feel like everything you write is terrible and you're floundering. But with this book, I was like, I want to write stories that feel like novels in and of themselves. And they are long gear. And well, they you accomplish that. Yes. And I go into the past of characters and then I go forward with the current situation. And the other thing I did was I set the stories all on a lake in Alaska called Diamond Lake. And so each of the stories, the different characters appear at different time periods, right? Like you'll see a girl at eight and then you'll see her at 45 when she's getting married. Or you'll see her grandmother a um, hundred years ago when, at the founding of the state you know, where Diamond Lake is being dug out, right, and purchased as part of a, a, a surveyor's uh, dream. So I wanted to have that feeling of, 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 of community because Alaska is so big. And when you live in these communities in Alaska, even if you're in the middle of Anchorage, which is technically a city, if you live on a lake like that, or you live in a little neighborhood, everybody knows everybody. I mean, literally everybody talks about, you know, it's, it's tight. And um, it has a richness about like a our town feeling in a in a story collection, which is what I wanted. Well, the, the layers are so rich that <laughs> I felt like, just like I said, uh, you could have you can take any one of these, and perhaps maybe someday you will, um, and expand upon them in any in any direction you wanted, and it would still be there's still so much left to share. I, I mean, I just I, I well, didn't feel like it lacked anything, but yet yeah. I felt like I wanted to know more. There's a really long one at the center called Al uh, Alcan and Oral History, which is about three women going up the Alcan and their children, some of them have children, some don't have children. And they all kind of, you know, it's watching them. One of them is going up out of desperation with her kids and the other one are two young, hopeful 20 somethings. And that story told in all those different perspectives took 76 pages, but you're changing narrators. So it feels like a mini novel at the center. And that's the one when I go to bookstores, I worked so hard on that and I had no confidence about it. I even thought I should pull it like 900 times. Oh, I was wow. like, I don't, this is the only one I feel is a little weak, blah, blah, blah. And I just real, and, and now I go into bookstores and people are like that, that, no, that novel that you put in the middle of the story is Alcan. I mean, everybody talks to me about that. Like they get upset. Sometimes they cry. They want me to turn it into a novel. They talk to me about it for hours, um, which is, a, I guess, a real lesson. In yeah. And it also is a actually lesson many too. people want me to turn that into a novel. And I'm not, well, and I'm the not thing sure. about it too is, is um, I think if you think about just as a writer, uh, I never throw out anything because what right. I think is no good on Tuesday. I reread right. it the next Thursday or two weeks later. And so much of it is good. So much of it is exactly yeah. what I wanted. And so I, I, I understand the difference. A woman thing. What, like, I don't yeah. want to put everything in like gender camps now that we're like re-examining gender. And I love that whole discussion. But for women of my, you know, women who grew up, you know, being so hard on ourselves. And it's a real problem as a writer. And I have it just like you do. Like I have half written novels and I'll go back and read them and be like, the writing was really good here. What was I thinking? Why did I think this was so bad? You know, but I think we, we, we kind of grew up for a lot of us that we not only had to be, we had to be perfect. We had to be better than everybody else. If we even got to go into the room, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know what? A, a typewriter changed my life. I got a, I got a yeah. typewriter when I was eight years old that had corrective ribbon. And up oh. until that point, when I would write, if my writing, my little literal yeah. pen to paper didn't look neat enough, I would rip out oh. the page and start over. Wow. Um, and so once I got a typewriter that had corrective ribbon, I was off and running. It didn't, I could make yeah. mistakes, fix them yeah. and keep writing. And yeah. I, I think about that, um, that was a pivotal time in my life to be, yeah. be able to make mistakes as a writer and feel like it wasn't going to ruin the whole page. Um, also, don't you remember the pleasure of a typewriter? Like my mother no. had some old electric one that 
hummed it. It felt so crisp when you, not the manual ones, and I'm not that old, but she had an <laughs> old electric one where you would touch it, you know, and make such a terrific sound. Yeah. My, my first, uh, the second typewriter from my red one was, was a manual one. Oh, and I, wow. and I loved I, it. I bought one, but it's like, looked like it was just like a piece of, like it was a decoration. I wish I I'd saved mine. I really wish I'd saved mine. The one uh, that I wrote my first book with was a brother and it was yes. a thing that you type and, and then it would print out later. Yes. My friend Elizabeth had that in college. I remember yeah. that. And I was like, yeah, I, yeah that's I've what always, I had. I mean, I've always been lucky enough. I'm like a real Mac person. I'm on my 90s. I am too. You know, I started with the 2E when I was 16. My cousin, my uncle gave it to me as a gift and I'm, I'm dyslexic. And so the great thing about that for me was it would list all the misspelled words in, a, right. in an essay. It would not tell you how to spell them. You then literally had to take out the dictionary and find out how that word was spelled and then reinsert the changes. But that was miles ahead of where I was. I mean, I was a train wreck. I mean, people could not believe you know, that I was going to become, it, it does seem laughable in retrospect that I'm a writer. Um, well, and I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a fast hunt and peck writer uh, because, yeah. because I got a typewriter so young, I never learned how to type properly, properly. And I oh, tried right. in high school to take the class. Yeah. And I was, I had old habits. So, well, yeah. let's take a break. I want to um, come back and talk more about your career as a writer. I am yeah. talking with Lee Newman. The book is called Nobody Gets Out Alive. Highly recommend um, this collection of stories, short stories. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello, I am back. I'm talking with Lee Newman. Nobody Gets Out Alive is the title of the book. I happen to have an advanced copy I received from Lee when visiting her and meeting her in New York City just a couple of months ago. Thanks again for being here. So we talked a lot about just the making of this book, but what I want to talk about now is the making of you as right. an author, your career. And you've worked with and for some of the biggest names in media and publishing, Oprah herself. Um, and so I think a lot of people's perception would be, well, of course you get to write books and they're successful, but I I'm guessing that can't be further from the truth. No, actually it's not. I mean, I know how it looks. I, I when I, my first book was called still point stars and that was the memoir. And I had already signed that book. I started writing that book in 2009 when the economy crashed and I actually didn't have a job and I had a second baby on the way and I sold it with like in three weeks. Like I, you know, I was just doing what I could do, right. To keep everybody together and like in diapers and, um, and then about right after my son was born, I was still writing it. Right. I, it was like already about 2011 and my son was like two years old and, um, I got this job offer from Oprah and they were like, great, come back, but it's a big job, right? You know, it's a big job. My book was not done and I had children. So I spent most of my first two or three years at Oprah, literally waking up at four 30 in the morning then right until 7 30 to finish this book and turn it in and get it published. Right. And then getting, because the you'd already sold it. Yeah, it's already, it was already sold. So, but you know, you actually have to follow through and put it yeah. out. Right. Um, yeah. And I only had about 80 pages written when I sold it on a proposal. So I, I would wake up at four in the morning and literally write till seven 30, get the kids going, then throw on my clothes and then go work a full day at Oprah and then come back at six o'clock, you know, make dinner. Sometimes I'd realize I'd be at Oprah and I had worn my slippers all day long as shoes and no, they were so loving to me. They nobody said anything. Nobody ever said anything. <laughs> Thank goodness. And I remember one time, like I just cried. And, and I, and every other job I've had in media, like I used to work for all these magazines, you don't cry at the office, but right. Oprah, they were like, it's okay, babe, everybody cries here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh man, I'm never going to leave here. Cause I love to cry. Um, and permission so to cry or, or it was, you know, and then, to cry. And then actually I was there when I started my, but at the same time, I'd also started a publishing company called Black Balloon, which later became Catapult. So at times I was doing two, three jobs, plus writing a book, plus kids. And I really had to learn how to be, well, very disciplined, which I already am. And most Alaskans are. I and mean, if you grow up in the bush, in the wilderness for a lot of your life, you are disciplined because if you mess up on something, you don't check your fuel lines, you don't get the water out of your floats, you mess around on the raft and fall into the water, you could, you'll die. And so that is like something that I live with growing up. And I, I think it does make me more hardcore, even about, you know, things in, in big old New York city, you know? Um, but it also made me realize about how to use my time. Like it, it's gotta be on fire. So I focus on one thing at that, you know, the thing that most needs it and then I'll release and focus on the next thing. And um, that sort of allowed me to write books and have a career that would support myself and give myself a lot of time to write books, which I needed. I mean, nobody gets out alive, took a lot longer 
to write because I was writing eight different stories about eight different families in Alaska, not just my family. And I had to make up all these details. Well, making it up, that's the thing is um, yeah. your brilliant mind at work in this. And I think it's brave um, to, to take, to create short stories because I, you're constantly pivoting, constantly yes, pivoting. That's why it's more like, you'll finish one and you'll be like, wow, I love Yay. it. I told this woman's story. Cause they're all about women. Mostly they're about women. I think there's two male narrators in there, but even the men are just talking about the women in their lives. These, you know, kind of very stubborn, hardworking, outspoken ladies who have a lot of pain inside is really what I think of most Alaskan women. But, you know, I'd finish that one and then it'd be like, okay, now what do I do? I got to invent a whole other lady and her bad marriage or that, you know, she, is she going to have this baby or not? Or, you know, is she going to, is she going to, you know, run away from this abusive husband, you know, through Canada with, you know, in a Cadillac or not, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And yeah. It, 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 it would take me the sense that, you know, those first 10 pages to figure out who everybody was would take me an enormously amount of long time. And then I would actually have to stop. So I'd have like two, three, 10 page stories going, but I got to page 10. So I knew who people were. And then I would actually have to go away to Alaska where I shut myself in a cabin for about two weeks each year, sometimes three, sometimes four, and just finished all the stories. Oh, gotcha. Because now I knew who the people were, right? I yeah, just yeah. need to add scenes. What did yeah. they want? Which, you know, did they have the baby? Did the bear kill them? Did they did they find the shoes on sale at Fred Meyer so their kids <laughs> in kindergarten? You know? Yeah. Well, the thing too that about your success with this book and your first book, Still Points North. Thanks. Um what what I've what I've a lot of people ask me advice about writing and how do you yeah. there's a very different big difference between authoring and writing, obviously, right? right. The business of being an author and the Right. The gift and talent and fun sometimes and hard work of being a writer. But what I what I think about with you and having read so much about you and having met you in person and having been around you and Zibby together and you yeah. we'll talk just a moment. <clears throat> excuse me, we'll talk in just a moment about what you're working on together. But um having the job, the big job, uh, you could have just skated with the, the big job. I mean, obviously I you had not to have. finish I it. could not have. I'll just tell you this. I knew. So I've been writing since I was 21 in secret. And, um, you know, I just grew up in one of those families. And I think a lot of people grew up in this kind of family. I don't think there's anything new about it where your dad says, well, and your mom says, we, we, we paid for college, which is a huge privilege. Thank you. And they just give you a handshake and that's it. You know what I mean? Like nobody was paying for my apartment. I don't even know what it was. I knew not a single person in New York City, except for one guy, Rohan Sippy from college. But I thought I'd heard all these stories that writers went to New York City. So I went there, right? you know, and I got a room without a window for like $400. You know what I mean? Right. I well, and so it was, so was, so what I guess what I mean is you, the, some people would have made just the big job work because you, I mean, for no, some people I always getting writing, the job, always right? writing and I turned yeah. down big and job that wasn't going to work for you. Yeah. You had, to I've, I've always writer. written and actually mm-hmm. I've been offered a lot of big jobs that you just, that aren't on my resume. You know, even at Oprah, they said, do you want to be editor in chief of the website one day? And I was like, no, at my first job, I was almost going to be, you know, um, editorial chief. I mean, senior editor or something at this magazine, I turned them down. I was like, I have to protect my writing. And actually that's the only thing that has changed in this year since the pandemic. Um, I have just decided that, no, I can be the editor in chief and I can write, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's about how I do it. I, I have been holding myself back for this idea of the sacred writing uh, dream I had in my mind, but I think I, I thought I needed all this coddling, but really with writing, you just have to write, right? If you write for two hours every day, you're a writer. Exactly. You know what I mean, I don't know why I was protecting it under a golden globe with little drizzles of glitter glittering down, you know, right. right. Um, you can do any job. Right. Yeah, and yeah. actually, the more successful you are at your job, the more um, you think differently and you learn differently from more people because you're it's a wide you're just not going into your cubicle. Right. You're talking to 20 people a day about how to solve problems and you, it kind of opens up your mind, your creativity. In my case, I, I work. In well, and also field, it might be but, part of the transition of having written the first book and haven't, you know, seen that you could do both. You yeah, know, you're right. No, no, that absolutely. Yourself. The confidence levels I have now are so different, especially after this last book, because, you know, I didn't know I could write fiction. Well, you know, I was terrified, you know, it, with your memoir, you can at least say, well, that was my life. I mean, you know, I, I have something to say because I know what my life was, right? right. But with fiction, you're like, And what happens if I'm not good? And what happens if everybody laughs when I turn this up? What happens if I spent six years writing something that's not any good and I have wasted all that time? Do you know what I mean? Those. Well, I hope you have shut that voice down. 
for yeah. life. I hope that <laughs> now voice- I feel, I yes. almost feel like euphoric. Yes, you can do anything. You know, like when you do yeah. something and you accomplish it and you do it in the way that you want to do it. I mean, nobody else was saying, oh, write stories about Alaskan, rural Alaskan women. Yeah. Or, and city Alaskan women too, because that was part of what I wanted to talk about was the Alaskans that have sidewalks, the Alaskans that have driveways, the Alaskans that shop at Costco, because all of the stuff on television is like Alaskans living in a tent. You know, exactly, that's true. Right. there's a lot of that, but there's also plenty of other Alaskans who are, who are, you know, struggling with the wilderness, but also living in the suburbs, you know, and there's opioid in, in the suburbs, you know, there's, you know, there's an epidemic, there's crime, there's all of the things, not a repair man. I mean, you know, <laughs> right. I, I just wanted to be realistic. So well, let's take a break. Say. I want to go back. Um, I want to talk then. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. We're talking um, about your book, Nobody Gets Out Alive. We're going to take a quick break. We have just a couple more minutes. I want to talk about your next big project. Okay, We'll be great. back in just a moment. I'm talking with Lee Newman. We're just wrapping it up here. Nobody Gets Out Alive fantastic collection of short stories. You are now uh, working with Zibby Owens on the new publishing company, Zibby Books. And so let's talk about how, why this mission, why this project and why Zibby? Um, well, um, well, I think first would be Zibby herself. All right. We met right before the pandemic and, you know, I, I kind of love what she does. Like she's a champion for other people. She reads all these books. She advocates for authors. She connects people. She's so personable that like, you know, if I was going to pick a partner that I'd really want to work with, it would be her. Do you know what I mean? And um, I think that as you get older, you have to be really careful, not just where you work, but who you work with. You know, um, I want it to be like collaborative and dynamic and full of ideas. And I also want us to have a mission. Like, I want to feel like I get out of bed and we are doing something. And with Zibby Books, we did. We came up with an idea. You know, we're a mostly female run um, publishing company and you, it's rare it's very, very rare to have like, we have a female publisher, right? You know, we have a female publicist and we have all kinds of different uh, women working there. there. There is one man, he's wonderful. But um, we're also like championing, it, you know, rethinking about how the publishing experience is for authors and for readers. You know, most of our authors are, are female, but I would say that we're not trying to have like a totally, you know, political agenda. We want juicy, wonderful novels, right? And we want authors to be treated with respect and time and attention. And by making a small company that focuses on those authors, we're able to create books that make the authors feel honored and, you know, well taken care of and books that readers want to read because it's a juicy story that you want to turn pages that has issues in it and conversations in it that reflect your life. You know, these are books for people who love stories. And obviously I love stories. You know what I mean? Well, and I think just the story of, of it coming together and how yeah. um, even Zibby, who, I'll, who will, I'll share on this show as well from our stop during the Don't Wait Project tour, uh, her coming into uh, being an author and her sharing yeah. the love of books. And it is a love of books. It's a love of words and yeah. it's a love of connection. And I think that that shines through. I'm actually a book ambassador for Zibby Books. Yes, and we'll be talking about um, some of the books in, that you have coming. You guys have your first book coming out in January. I mean, we'll be talking about those are, on the show. Or stories, whichever you, yes. there's a lot of books out there that don't tell stories, right? That are like, you know, very abstract and stuff. But I do feel like storytelling is a way of making community. And that's so much of like what we're trying to do, not just with sales ambassadors and bookstores, but by starting in-person Zibby book clubs in small bookstores. So that people can get together and talk about books you know, um, and make friends, not just show up at some random thing and drink a bunch of wine, but like actually make friends to talk about things that they love to talk about, which is, you know, honestly books, but, um, well, we could go, I could talk to you for hours. And so when oh. I have my podcast and I don't have to have okay. these hard breaks, I, I will definitely do that. So okay. we will talk again. This book is called nobody gets out alive. Lee Newman. Thanks for being here. Enjoy Seattle. And thanks for bringing the sunshine with you. Thank you. This was a great time. I really, I, I love this time with you. Thank you so much. 